Hi, California History. It's Mrs. Chappie. Welcome to our 11th class. Can you believe we only have one class left after this? I cannot believe how fast time is going by. Um, we are going to continue talking about California history today, and today is going to be uh, a discussion about the transcontinental railroad. So I'm kind of excited about that. I have something special from my office. I'll give you a sneak peek. There you go. You got a sneak peek. I'm going to be talking about that because that is the key to this lesson in the transcontinental railroad. So here we go. We're going to jump right in. Um, I'm going to share my screen, but also make sure you click on the video link below to watch Mr. Bett's video on the transcontinental railroad. He is hilarious and he does a really good job talking about all the things that I'm going to be talking about. But you know, Mr. Betts, he does it in his fun and silly musical way. So here we go. Screen share. Click, 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 click. Here we go. Up here someplace is my transcontinental railroad PowerPoint. Voila. And here we are. I can move my little self down to the corner. And you get to see a Mrs. Chappie in the corner. And I have some video, uh, not videos, I'm sorry, pictures to tell the story. So, whoops, if I can get me big, because I want to be big. There we go. So the topic, this railroad that's going across the continent. Last week, we talked about the telegraph, and we talked about how telegraph, the telegraph made communication with California faster and easier. We did a little exercise with Morse code, if you were on our Zoom. But even though they were able to talk quicker with this telegraph, traveling from California to California from the east still took a really, really long time. So they had to come up with a way to move people quicker. Now, there's this particular guy, his name's Theodore Judah, and he was an engineer. Now, if you don't know what an engineer is, an engineer is a person who designs things. They come up with structures like roads and bridges and machines, and that's what Theodore Judah did. And he helped build one of the first railroads in California. They built a railroad that went from Sacramento, which is where we know which was kind of the hub of all the gold rush with uh, Sutter's Fort was there and Sutter's Fort had dropped, made a road down to the waterfront. And we knew that there was a lot of people coming with their gold coming to the Sacramento area, but then they needed to get to um, San Francisco. I'm looking at the PowerPoint and it says help build the first railroad in California from Sacramento to California. That's not right. It's from Sacramento to San Francisco is where that first railroad was built. And this is the guy who did it. And I have a map to show you what that first map looked like of the railroad. And the reason I threw this historical map in is I thought this was kind of interesting because this doesn't look like California at all. It looks like you want to take it and kind of tilt it sideways because this over here is San Francisco. Over here is Sacramento. Up over here um, is El Dorado, like El Dorado County, where we are now, El Dorado Hills. It's like the whole map is kind of like on its side. It's like it doesn't have north going up to the top. It has north going to the side, which kind of bugs me. But I love historic maps, so I wanted to show it to you guys real quick. So this shows that first railroad, um, the Sacramento Valley Railroad, going from Sacramento to San Francisco. Now, after this railroad was built, um, Judah comes up with this idea that, you know, we need to raise some money and we need to make a railroad to go across the country. We can get, we can communicate quicker with our, um, our telegraph, but we still can't move people. So I think it's a good idea to have a railroad. So he collects some investors. Investors are people that put money into a business, hoping that they'll earn money back. Um, if you thought it was a good idea to have Chick-fil-A, say, in El Dorado Hills, you could invest money into a Chick-fil-A and hope that a lot of people would buy Chick-fil-A hamburgers and then, or I guess they're not hamburgers, are they? They're Chick-fil-A chicken burgers or chicken sandwiches. And that you're hoping that if you put money into that business, you'll make money back. So that's what an investor is. So Judah comes up with four main investors, a guy named Leland Stanford, 
You may have heard of Stanford University. That's his school named after him. A guy named Charles Croker. You've maybe been down to the Croker Art Museum in Sacramento. These are people that are in this area of California. So they're kind of the California founding people who were in this area. So we have a lot of stuff named after them. There's a guy, um, Huntington, maybe you've heard of Huntington Beach in Southern California, and Mark Hopson, Hop, uh, Hopkins. And these became what were known as the big four because they were the big four investors in this railroad idea. They thought that this was a good idea and that we should try to get a railroad that goes across the country. So these guys go to our national government, to what's called Congress, and they say, Congress, I think you need to pass a law and set aside some money to build this railroad. That's what the government does, is they build things that people can't build on their own. It would be a lot to get a couple of guys just to try and build a railroad, so they need the government to pay for it. So the government passes this law, it's called the Pacific Railway Act. And the purpose of this is to create this transcontinental railroad. And what transcontinental means is that it crosses the continent, the continent of North America, going all the way from the East Coast, all the way to the West Coast. And so that's what the whole purpose of this Pacific Railway Act is, is to create this railroad. So we have the big four, and they start their, their railroad company called the Central Pacific Railroad Company. And those are those four guys that we just talked about. Stanford probably being the most um, famous or the one that we most hear about because of Stanford University. Everyone's heard of Stanford University now. And they create their company called the Central Pacific Railroad Company. Well, there's another company back east, and they are called the Union Pacific Railroad Company. They're both um, Pacific railroads, right? The Central Pacific and the Union Pacific. And they're building in opposite directions. One's coming from the east, one's coming from the west, and they're going to meet somewhere in the middle. And I have a map for you because here I am and I love my maps and we can see where those two companies are. We have one building there and one building here. Now this one, this one built more miles of track because these ones are going through these terrible mountains here. I mean, they have mountains too, the Rocky Mountains, but the um, Sierra Nevada mountains were quite, quite a challenge. I'll show you some old pictures of those in just a second. So this is our transcontinental railroad from Nebraska to California. But now maybe you're scratching your head and go, Miss Chappie, what about all the other states that are up over here? Well, there was already railroads in that area that could connect to Nebraska. So I'll show you a map in a little bit, but there were railroads there. And if you're in my US history class, we've talked a lot about the importance of the railroads during the Civil War in moving troops and supplies and things like that and how there were much uh, more miles, many more miles, I guess, of railroads up in the northern area of the east side of our country. So they start building this railroad. And the first obstacle is going to be, how do we get through those big mountains? So they had to go over hills and flatten them out. They had to um, mine tunnels. They had to build bridges. They had to build something to protect the areas from snow when they went into the mountains. Those are called sheds that they had to build. And they were doing this at a time when we didn't have all the equipment and supplies that we have today. So here's a... a an old photograph of what it would look like to go across um, uh, some sort of either river or low-lying land where you'd have to build some bridge. This is super interesting. These are what are called snow sheds. And you, if you ever drive up to go skiing, maybe in Lake Tahoe, or you're just going up to the snow, going up in the mountains, um, going to Tahoe, you can look and you can still see snow sheds where trains go. And what this does is basically makes a shed around the railroad track so that it doesn't get all covered with snow. 
So this gives you an idea of kind of what the inside of it would look like, a snow shed in the Sierra Nevada mountains to keep the snow off of those um, railroad tracks so that the railroad, so the train can make it through. If you go down to the museum, if you've ever been to the museum in Sacramento, which we would, <laughs> we would have probably gone on a field trip to if it wasn't for this darn coronavirus in our sheltering in our houses, um, they show kind of the inside of what a shed would have looked like when it was being built. So this is in a museum there. Now, I was just telling you guys how much hard work it was to build these railroad tracks because there was no dump trucks, there were no bulldozers, all the work had to be done by hand. They used picks and shovels, sledgehammers um, to blast the rock. They used gunpowder. It could be very dangerous. You could have landslides. And it was very, 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 very physical to do. So we have some workers here. We'll talk in a minute about how many of the workers were immigrants from China, about 15,000 of them. Um, and this shows a photograph. This is going to be a train track there. We just can't see it quite yet. The conditions were really, really hard. I like this picture here because it shows the, the blasting to make a tunnel into the side of the mountain. And we have a Chinese immigrant worker there. And the immigrants from China, they had either come, some of them had come, um, or I guess most of them, I guess you could say, had come to California as part of the gold rush, hoping to find their riches, just like everyone came to California, and then were there and needed work. And so working on the railroad was a way to earn a living. The bad part was, is these immigrants were paid less than other workers. They had to work longer hours. They were not treated quite, quite as, as great, but yet I put a quote for you by Leland Stanford, and he said, without them, it would be impossible to complete the Western portion of this great national enterprise. So one of the four, the big four, who were building this railroad said it couldn't have happened without these Chinese immigrant workers. We call this a primary source quote because it was in a letter that he wrote. So I told you guys I'd show you a map in a little bit. This you can see all the other railroads that are over on the East Coast and how they end here in Nebraska. And then it goes from Nebraska to California. So this is becoming transcontinental going across the continent. When I was your age and I learned about it, I thought it probably went all the way over to the East Coast. It didn't. It was to Nebraska. And then it picked up on railroads that were already built. So when they were building it, these two, these two union companies were trying to compete against, compete against each other. They both wanted to beat each other and lay the most track and, and get the furthest um, to their destination first. And so they would communicate with their workers and send messages through the telegraph, but they didn't want the other side to know exactly what was happening. So they would send their message coded, it's called a cipher meaning that um, they would have a special code. If it said under the tree, under the tree might mean on Tuesday, or it might say um, uh, over the field, and that might mean um, go fast. So they would have words that meant different words. It was like a secret code so that the other side wouldn't know what they're doing. And if you come and meet with me on Zoom on Thursday, that's what we're gonna do in classes. We're gonna make up mystery codes. So I hope that will be kind of fun. So the government, because remember, it was the government who was paying for all this, gave the companies land and money for each mile of track they laid. So that's why there was this big competition to lay the more to lay more track because they would get more land. So, oh, did I not put it on there? I, oh, I don't think I did. Okay, so I thought I had a picture on there, but I didn't put it on there yet. So finally, these two sides are coming together and they meet on May 10th, 1869. The two lines meet in Utah near this city called Promontory. And this was kind of nice. They chose eight Chinese workers 
to lay the final section of track because the Chinese workers had laid most of the track. So they were honoring them by letting them be the, the final people that laid the track. And when the two things came together, they joined them together with this ceremonial, here's where I get to show you this, golden spike. See, my golden spike has um, a train on it. Oops, if I could show you there. It has a train on it. And this represents the, the spike that was put in at the, um, when they connected the two. Now, actually, fun Mrs. Chappie useless history facts, there were actually four golden spikes made. So different people who were there, one for each of the, um, the big four who had originally invested in it. And Leland, Sp Leland Stanford put in the final spike of gold, um, and they pre-drilled a hole, and then he tapped it in ever so ever so um, carefully with this silver hammer, and it was in there um, to signify the unification of this transcontinental railroad. Uh, the gold spike that was actually made out of real gold did not stay in the ground. They took it out, and he got to keep it. It was engraved on the side, and it had the date and things like that on it, and um, then went to a museum. I think I have a picture of it here. So let, let me move me down here. So here is a drawing showing the two sides coming together. You have the two railroads uniting right in the middle there in Utah. And here we have, if you look right down there at the bottom, you can see that golden spike and you see Leland Stanford going to be the one who's going to pound in that golden spike. If you go to this location in Utah, you can see where that was. You can see there is no gold there left there anymore. But this is where the two railroads met at this location. It's a historic site right now, obviously kind of a big deal uniting the two railroads together. And here is the actual spike. It's at Stanford University. If you want to see it, it's in the museum at Stanford University. Um, is where the, the spike that was put into the ground uniting the railroads is. There's actually uh, one of, remember I said there were four, there's one of them at the Railroad Museum in Sacramento. You can see it there as well. If you're like Mrs. Chappie and you're just a dork, you can buy your own copy of the Golden Spike to put in your office with all your other miscellaneous history stuff that you like so much. And then the next thing I have for you guys is a super fun Mr. Betts video. I'm not going to play it on this recording. I'm just going to link it below so that you can actually watch it um, on your own. But it's a pretty fun one. So this was kind of a quick little overview of the Transcontinental Railroad, the role of the Chinese immigrants. Remember, an immigrant is someone who comes from another country to a new country. So. Um, they had been in China and came to the United States of America. That makes them an immigrant. We have immigrants today. If, um, in fact, my niece married an immigrant. He's an immigrant from Great Britain. And so he's now living in the United States because he married my niece and becoming an American citizen. But he is an immigrant. So that is what that word means. So this was, like I said, a very short little overview of the Transcontinental Railroad and its importance to California. Obviously, it connected California to the rest of the United States. When I see you guys in, at our Zoom on Thursday, we will work on a cipher together, which is what they used when they were building the Transcontinental Railroad. So until then, I hope you guys have a really, really good week, and I look forward to seeing you then. I'll get, let you see my spike one more time just because I really like it. Pretty cool. Okay, guys, have a good week.